Ecuador's presidency. After all, he said he was in a hurry. Uh, so we can talk about the size of government, vigilantism, allegations of corruption, and the Special Prosecutor Act. Free SHS, uh, free SHS who can forget about the digital addressing system. Ghana Beyond Aid, the fight against Galamse. Lots of things happened in 2017. We'll go back to those events that characterized Nanado's one year in office. Uh, we also ask with supersonic speed, what are we to expect in 2018? My name is Mamavio Owusu-Abwaje. Today we're coming to you live from the Ghana International Press Center. Let me introduce my guests who are seated. Dr. Kojo Asante is a Senior Research Fellow Center for Democratic Governance. He leads CDD's elections program. He has a lot of experience in the areas of social accountability, local government and decentralization, parliamentary strengthening, as well as constitutional and legal reform. Good morning, sir. Thank Good you morning. for being here. Also, Mr. Ibrahim Tanko Amido is governance, civil society and development management expert with experience facilitating social political development processes at national and international levels. He leads the multi-donor funded strengthening transparency, accountability and responsiveness in Ghana program, commonly referred to as Star Ghana. Good morning to you, Good sir. Morning. You're almost like the money man, the <laughs> bank. <laughs> <laughs> you gave a lot of money out last year. Indeed. You were part of our, our development process yeah. uh, largely last year. We'll come to some of the things that you did last year as well. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much, um, and congratulations to Ghanaians on the, the Silver Jubilee of yeah. our... Uh, in fact, I want us to begin from there, okay. and then we'll go into some of the, the things that you did last year okay. and what we are to expect right. uh, this year in 2018. Perhaps I should start with you, uh, Dr. Kujia Santi, because yeah. the CDD has issued a statement. Yeah. We marked 25 years of the Fourth Republic. Was that celebration, first, first of all, was it necessary? Absolutely. I mean, this is the longest running constitutional order since independence. So uh, if you cast your eyes around Africa and you see the, the challenges and the struggles that many countries uh, have gone through just to have political stability, I think uh, it is something that we have to mark, uh, learn lessons and, and ensure that we can keep because without that, you cannot have prosperity, you cannot think of transformation, you cannot think of uh, making, you know, improving the welfare of citizens. So I think it needed to be marked. I think it's, it's, it's a very important, uh, you know, um, anniversary that we should really take advantage of mm -hmm. and, and try to reflect on our 25 years uh, under this constitutional mm -hmm. order. Mr. Tanko, the way we marked it at the Independence Square, yeah. uh, massive celebrations was that necessary well um yes in a way but i think that it's not sufficient so we could do more than what happened at the um independence square so the independence square could have been the culmination of conversations and commemorations across the length and breadth of the country so that we then bring it all together in a celebration um, perhaps maybe the organizers are thinking of starting with a big celebration and then going down to the local level. But I would have preferred that we started from the local level, built up, you know, the awareness, the consciousness, the conversations around what did we achieve, where are the gaps, etc. And then say, okay, now that we've had these conversations, let us celebrate. So, yeah. Okay. But the CDD has issued a statement and then you outline a number of things that uh, we have not been able to achieve even though we're 25 years. Uh, and I, w I want you to go over some of the things that we've talked about. Yeah. And if there is hope, if we haven't been able to do it in 25 years, well, in how many years can we, be, well, can we do mean, it? Yeah, the, the, the life of many countries, I mean, some of them are much older than us as a, as a country. Um, but I think we've achieved a lot. I think uh, our uh, statement was to... Uh, draw attention to what we consider as really structural things, things that you need to completely overcome in order for you to uh, achieve the, you know, the lofty idea of a Ghana beyond aid, which is basically a self-sufficient, uh, um, you know, uh, Ghana, where our people's welfare um, are, you know, completely, their needs are met, uh, we've reduced poverty, people are working and so on. But one of the things we highlighted was 
the I, fact that we've had basically voice without accountability. What we are doing here uh, is a free expression of, of voice. You see that on radio shows everywhere. It's a huge uh, a proliferation of, of, of media platforms for people to engage. But we still hear all of those exposures about corruption. Mm -hmm. We still hear all of those exposures about corruption. Mm -hmm. We still hear, you know, uh, government uh, or, uh, or different organized institutions just completely not. There's a lot of noise, uh, but we are not getting uh, what is critical to any demo democracy, mm. which is accountability. We still continue to run basically a boom and bust economy that has produced jobless growth. You know, so if you if you look, we have sustained growth uh, for a period of, of maybe about 20 years. It was a cycle and you, it's not sustained and then when you talk about social development you know that uh, you know, uh, I, I know just you can get into the poverty line so easily just because of inflation or any kind of macroeconomic uh, dynamics that occur in the economy so we, 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 we really have not built, uh, diversify the economy, make it strong enough mm. to resist the shocks. Um, these are huge structural things that if you, you have to fix if you are going to be self-sufficient. So I thought that we thought that it was important that, mm. you know, on this day, that is the kind of reflection. You also talk about a lot of power to. being invested in the executive yes. and then the RTI bill yes. that the has not been passed. Yes. RTI bill, which itself is kind of symptomatic of uh, sometimes where our priorities lie because everybody puts out that, you know, process of accountability. Uh, it's been a difficult reason why it's not. So I a reflection to then say, okay, this is where we are. This, the, you know, how we got here. These are the lessons we've learned. What are we going to do differently going forward? And it's important because this government is talking about a Ghana beyond the age. Mm. That is a goal that, okay, yeah, we can look at that goal. But how do you get there? Um, and if you're going to get there, our suggestion is that you need to address these kinds of problems. Their democracies, particularly because you know, but after the voting, what else? A government uh, accountable um, institutions that are able to work as they should you know, without looking over their shoulders or taking their marching orders or something uh, others. Um, a democracy that is, you know, yielding dividends for all the citizens of this country. You know.
And I think that, you know, whilst we're congratulating ourselves, we need to be... Parties, you know, the constitution and this is for that. Say that, you know, parties are probably the new tribes because now people uh, join parties and, and, and seek to get the same thing that you get from being a member of the tribe, mm. you know. So, um, they, they become election machines to capture the state uh, and basically, you know, service their, their groups and friends and, and so on. And between the two dominant parties, there's not been any real change. So they are not programmatic parties that are there mm -hmm. canvassing, you know, ideas and pushing and trying to transform uh, society, which is what the constitution envisages. So, you know, they just set up their... Uh, institutes, training institutes, and you, know, you, you want to hope that it is not a nominal uh, sort of reaction to, to a need because to prepare people for leadership is not a, a, you know, something that has to be taken uh, in a trivial manner. This is, this is a public service. It is the noblest of society. It is the most people who sacrifice, who go to serve the public interest. So there's a lot of orientation that you have to give to people, but there's also a lot of capacity that you have to give people. You cannot take somebody uh, from wherever their walk of life, take them to the bureaucracy and expect that, that they can perform because they are either in the private sector. There are particular rules, there are particular orientation, public interest orientation that you have to have. So the parties have to look within themselves and develop a party that is fit for a Ghana beyond aid. Without that, in a multi-party system, you cannot move forward, you will stagnate. And really, that is what has happened, because our parties are not fit for purpose. I think that sets the tone. Yeah. Let's go back to Nana Dudanko Ekufuado's first year in office. Yeah. What's on your mind? There were a lot of talking points in mm. 20. 17. Yeah. How would you begin the recap? Well, I would say that um, beyond the um, first uh, slip up in relation to the speech, the inaugural <laughs> speech, <laughs> I would, I would uh, very generously call it a slip up. <laughs> Even though it's not something that, you know, should be countenanced because you don't pay attention to detail, it reflects in everything that else that you That's do. Right. Mm. You know, but you know, I, I found elements of that speech quite inspiring. Um, citizens, not spectators, moving towards self-sufficiency and therefore Ghana beyond aid. You know, galvanizing the whole country behind an agenda. These are very inspiring words. Um, the challenge is translating the words into reality. Mm. Um, it said that um, you campaign in poetry and then govern in prose. <laughs> yeah. And we had all the poetry on the campaign yes. platforms, you know. And we are seeing the prose in terms of what's happening. Um, the vigilantism, which is something that didn't just suddenly occur, you know. It's been bubbling in the background, but because as a nation we failed to confront this things head on, we are now seeing it coming, surfacing, and then um, in the ways in which we, we've seen the invisibles and etc. 
we've had all these issues of corruption coming up. And it's almost as if we are rewinding the conversations that we've had under the previous government, just that the names are changing. And so you ask, what has changed in the way in which corruption is being dealt with under this government that has made, that has said that um, uh, it's... Uh, but then we've also had, you know, cheering news like um, the free SHS that for me, despite all the challenges, represents a way of developing the manpower, the critical manpower we need to move forward as a country. That there are hiccups that we need to. We've had the aspirations around, you know, easing the way we do business, you know. So it, it, it's mixed. And if I was a lecturer and I was asked to uh, grade, I would say that um, the government has scored a B in the yeah um, the lower grades. I wouldn't in one. its first year. In its first year, I would say okay. It's a B. Yeah. Wow, that's a that's a generous B then. <laughs> <laughs> would it would you, would you give it a yeah, a B no, grade I, as well? I, I would. I mean, I think I mean you know uh, for a long time. You see, when your president speak, you 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 want to listen and you know. Even as a citizen, you want to be inspired, you know, inspired by it. And I think uh, his speech was inspiring. I think even the the speaker's speech was was inspiring. I mean, for us in the governance uh, arena, everything we wanted to hear, yeah. we heard the right things. We heard the right words being said, the mm -hmm. right commitments being put out. Um, and then, as he said, as soon as we got into the pros, you know, you appoint 110. Mm -hmm. ministers mm -hmm. and then immediately you are sort of uh, wondering okay so what what where is the gap what is happening because what happened in 2015 was uh, a vote not for a change in government mm -hmm. but a change in the way we do politics I mean a groundswell you know that was that was affected in the form of the change in government but the real sort of push and desire by many people, people that I spoke to, just thought that the time was right. Mm -hmm. And they saw Akufuado in that mode, that somebody that oh, didn't have uh, you know, uh, the, the attachments uh, that you know, can restrain him. So he was fit to take on this role mm -hmm. uh, at the ripe old age of, <laughs> you know, uh, was it 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70 yeah. yeah. So um, that was that was the the desire of the people. So it meant that everything that you did had to signal change. Mm. So we used to having a lot of you know big government and a lot of ministers. That was the first step. That if you wanted uh, to have a, a fit, purposeful government and so on, if you wanted to protect the public purse. This was the stuff that you have to do, so that didn't happen, and we had, and his justification was that, oh, okay, we, he was in a hurry, mm -hmm. uh, he thought politicians uh, could, you know, deliver better, but I completely disagree because all the evidence actually point to the opposite. So at the end of 2017, did you, or looking back, yeah. has he been justified in terms of the numbers? No, I mean, I think, you know, your free SHS, you, you could have, it's, it's basically prioritizing a, a particular policy uh, uh, option. Uh, and once you, you wanted it done, it will be done. Mm. And you don't need uh, more ministers to be able to do it. I think when you have more uh, political actors in the bureaucracy, it actually creates more confusion uh, because they are politicians. and. They have different agendas. They are trying to seek re-election. They will get distracted down the, you know, down the path. So that for me was just, you know, my reading of of of, of, of public service and politics in this country did not justify that that kind of uh, uh, you know approach. So that that was a problem. Mm. Um, and then of course the vigilante matter came. Yeah. And again, we have gone through transitions. We know that this always happened and. We expected that a signal will be given immediately that this will not be countenance, particularly when you know that kind of uh, uh, impunity to assault a security officer that you have appointed 
even among the it's almost like when you assault a public officer mm -hmm. in certain jurisdictions it actually carries a higher penalty mm -hmm. because it undermines the rule of law your officers cannot work if, if so the, the you know the reaction to it was was not uh, adequate eventually the outcome uh, was disappointing uh, in many ways you know particularly after the storm at court as well mm -hmm. so those those matters really did not uh, did not help but you know as we said it's a mixed bag you have free shs i think it's so fundamental in spite of the the financial challenges we have to make it work because seriously you cannot think about transformation when your most of your public service your migration service your security services you are recruiting from high school mm -hmm. level and they have to have the skill set to be able to do basic things and you cannot run any modern economy without that kind of level mm -hmm. of education so it has to be the minimum uh, so for me it's it's a development imperative for us to make it work you know there are huge challenges but we have to commit and do it sure. you know so those those for me are you know it's a, it's a mixed bag of of things uh, mm. the special prosecutors act mm. was passed we were very involved in that because we think that you need an anchor to tackle corruption corruption fighting has stagnated for so long that you just needed in spite of the shiraj and all of the yokos and so on you just needed a new sort of impetus mm -hmm. and, uh, and the special prosecutor offers that but you know it's not just the law yeah it's, it's whether we, we we appoint somebody who's independent enough mm -hmm. to to do the job whether we provide the resources when we get when we get into going into this year yeah. what we are yeah. to expect there's something interesting that the general secretary of the ndc uh, has been saying about the prosecutors act sure. and the person who would be in charge and the kind of work that they would do. I'll bounce it off you. Okay. Uh, but Mr. Tanko, we've also seen quite a number of people losing their jobs yeah. uh, just for the reason that they, they were associated yeah. or they associated with the yeah. previous administration. Yeah. And we continue to see, yes. we still continue to see people yeah. losing their jobs. That's also like a tradition that yeah. keeps yeah. going on once yeah. there's a change. And it, it just doesn't just keep going on, but it keeps worsening. Yes. I mean, at the beginning, you know, the changes were associated with the top echelon of, you know, governance. Then we went a step below. Um, some time back, we heard that the president's office had appointed a PRO for a state agency, mm -hmm. you know. So we are gradually getting to the point where with the change in governance, I mean, our government, there's almost every position that is paid out of government chess will be up for grabs. So you lose the institutional memory, yeah. you lose the experiences that are necessary, but you also lose that critical sector, mass of workers who insulates the business of government from the politics of government, you know. And it's so dangerous that I think we, we, we just, as a country, need to sit down and say, hey, this can't go on you know because that everybody has an eye to the next four years mm -hmm. and you can't That's govern right. a country you can't develop a country based on four-year yeah. time horizons mm -hmm. a chief director four years is out yeah. a very skilled technical person four years is out how do you build a country you know so i think it's one of the areas that needs you know we might have to revisit the transition acts yes well, first of all, we have to look at the way the civil service, you know, functions and the regulations and to say, how do we insulate this critical group of people from the vicissitudes of, you know, as change, somebody looks at your face, oh, Mama V, we once saw you, yeah. you know, laughing mm -hmm. at a joke, yeah. you know, um, so you are, so you are yeah, one of them, yeah. so you have to go. Yeah. Um, change of government, then you target offices, mm -hmm. you go and lock. And yeah. I think in the heat of the campaigning, somebody had said, you know, when we win, don't wait to be told. Just identify the office that you want and go and then take a position. And we saw that happening. Even toll booths, you know, mm -hmm. were taking over. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's a, a very dangerous trend. But it is also tied to the way, I mean, and um, as my brother said, our political parties function. They are more or less, you know, machines.
that seek electoral victory, promise whatever you want. How are the parties funded? What kind of arrangements do they come to with people, uh, financiers? And are these some of the replications of that this thing about, you know, we ignoring the fact that huge sums of money, has, I mean, you know, the parties spend huge, and yet nobody tells us where does where's the money coming from? The abuse, philanthropists. Is there any cap on how much an individual can put into your party? You know, so all these are part of the issues that we need to come to grips with, address if in 25 years' time we're going to be looking at how we have um, taken the democracy forward. Mm. I wanted to just give a, another example of this, you know, um, you know, this partisan bureaucracies that we are trying to build. You know, you have a, we, we're trying to achieve universal health care through a national health national health issue has become partisan. Mm. So that's where you put your youth leaders and whatever mm. and as coordinators for different districts mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And there's an expectation that that's where. Mm. The same with the education sector, you know, all of the uh, social protection, mm. um, you know, uh, interventions that we are making. You cannot run a 21st century healthcare system with people, you know, by using that as an avenue for rewarding foot soldiers. Yeah. The NHS in, uh, in the UK is a highly trained, these are professionals, because for you to maintain these systems, you need capacity. Yeah. You need people who have technical uh, know-how to do these things. It's not some, you know, something that you just throw a bone that you throw to people. Mm. So we you know we are living a you know we are if we th we think we want to do Ghana beyond aid. Mm. If you want to run your NHS NHIS like that mm. or your school feeding program like that or your leap system Let or your youth very whatever quickly, system like the that. example of Nadmo. Yeah mm. you, the you know disaster the management yeah. organization okay. An institution or an organization that should be run by amateurs. Disaster response, disaster prevention, disaster management is a highly skilled, you know, area. And yet, what we see, Nadmo has also been put into the patronage pot to be doled out, you know, to deserving members of the winning party. And so then we have a disaster, and yeah. we see the kind of response yeah. from from the agencies. I've had accusations from the other side that. CSOs, mm. people like your good selves, yeah. you watch these things happen mm. and you expect that when there's a change, mm. the other parties won't do the same? Yeah. Now, I'm sure you heard it from both parties. <laughs> because that's, that's, the, uh, that's the way to excuse, you know, because that, that person, oh yeah, you, you didn't say anything, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm sure I can give you how many statements. <laughs> investigate. Shiraj, for example, uh, has powers to investigate if there are discrimination. Their administrative justice mandate mm. includes investigating such allegations. Mm. So why, for example, if a party feels or even, I mean, I know some individuals take it to court. Mm. That is not enough. This is a systemic problem. Mm. And we will comment on it. We will raise those issues when they come up. But it's not enough. So they play the game. And then, you know, they'll turn around and say, oh, well, um, you know, nobody said anything. So mm. I'm, I'm fighting for equalization when I come. With whose, whose money? This is a public resource. Mm. It's not your personal, you know, private property. So, um, yeah, we hear all of that accusation all the time because that's it. They actually take count. Mm. Oh, okay. And when these people came and they mm. did this, you didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what are we, you know, we, we can't go and arrest them. We can't go and stop them from that. That there has to be uh, 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 a re an institutional response to it, and we can only agitate and advocate for that to happen. If it doesn't happen, you know, we you know we are powerless. But so I think, but you know, Atanko is right that we are that this particular we cannot run a public service this way. 
you cannot achieve transformation with the weak partisan public service. All of the lofty goals that we want in terms of our development, if you want to do one district, one factory, you need an efficient local government system that even when you set a factory up there, mm -hmm. they can you know, ensure regulatory compliance. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, you're not going to succeed. And it's a very simple fact. So um, it's just trying to deal with the realities. We have to find a balance, you know, for us, how to shape development. And I think in the 25 years, in some respects, being tolerant, uh, you know, providing uh, openness for uh, citizens, for media, for, you know, we've, we've, we're able to tolerate yeah. ourselves. Mm -hmm. But when it becomes almost like a, a mafia game where we tolerate ourselves so that those mm -hmm. few of us who are benefiting can continue, it, it doesn't benefit anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to change if we're going to go forward. I want us to talk about the National Digital Property Addressing System that ah. was also quite big. And when the president launched it, he said there would be a drastic reduction in the cost of doing business and the formalization of Ghana's economy when the National Digital Property Addressing System uh, you know, came into mm -hmm. force. He expected that there would be a, a revival of the collapsed businesses and then also make them viable. Is that what we saw? of 2017 well I tried it um, I wasn't happy with it <laughs> but I had a you know I, I think there was a backlash but I had a different attitude to it I thought okay this is a problem that we've been trying to solve for a, lo a long time yes we'll still need street addresses house numbers and all of those things this was for me complimentary that in the meantime as we're trying to sort this out if we can get more people to buy into that because that's the only way it's mm. going to work you have to self-register mm. so uh, maybe apart from businesses who because they need customers and so on they have you know the incentive to for citizens it's like okay i mean you know I, i'm not willing to put because maybe i'm worried about the security or all of those things but if we're able to do it it makes a big difference mm. and you know and if they improve the the um uh the uh, the accuracy of, of the information they have. I think it, it leaves strong, because that's what technology does. Mm. We've done with mobile money and so on. Mm. You know, so you have a unique uh, identified address, you know, numerical, alphabetical, whatever. And everybody's one is unique. Mm. If you can get you from one place to the other, mm. now with mobile phones, mm. why not? Mm. So I at least applauded the effort uh, that you are trying to solve a problem. Because it's a basic but fundamental problem that has to be solved. Mm. Uh, so that was my approach. But as I said, I tried it. And apart from yeah, my office, I got the address. I was trying to you know, connect to another place so I can get directions. You know, people say sometimes you get lost. Other places, it works. So I am all for it, that it can be improved. Uh, and if the, the, I mean, I think Joy has been doing a good job Instead of using yeah, that address, yeah. it's, a, it's a good, yeah, yeah it's a, it keeps you, it keeps, it keeps, it keeps, you know, keeps it in, in people's mind mm. that now they, you know, they put it as an address. Yes. If all the public agencies and so on are using it and popularizing it. I mean, we'll get there. And I think really some of the, these social problems, uh, development problems, that is how we're going to solve it. Yeah. If we work together, like Galam saying, I'm sure mm. we'll come we'll to Galam. We'll come Galamse, to Galam yeah. yes. And just adding to that, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not a technical person, so I can't speak to the technical side of it. But, I mean, just to re emphasize the importance of having this uh, addressing system that works. Um, a few weeks, weeks, months ago, my son called, you know, late at night around 1 a.m., that, you know, armed robbers were attacking their area, getting near the house. He didn't want to speak on the phone, I mean, calling the police, so I should do that. I called the police, they were very professional in their response. But in terms of describing where, the, I mean, the location was such a challenge. Get to this place, turn right, do this, do, et cetera. And they were very professional because they kept on calling me, yeah. yes, the people have reached this, did you say we should turn right, did you say we... And so it, it actually delayed the response it, time. Yeah. So in addition to you know, easing, you yeah. know, uh, making business, I mean, the ease of doing business, you know, 
even for security purposes, yes. and etc. I mean, I think it's a fantastic idea. The challenge, and not just with this one, but with all the new initiatives that we've been rolling out over the years, has been the fact of, you know, captured by a political yeah. party. So the opponents then tend to feel that if I say this is good, yeah. then I'm giving kudos to yeah. my opponent or my listener. Yeah. So how do we elevate some of these things to national priorities? Right, yeah that we come to a consensus and say, this needs to be done for A, B, C, D, E, F. So whether it is party X that is in power, party Y, we know that we'll take it forward. From what I'm hearing, it may well be that should there be a change in government, would, yeah, we yeah, might see this thing just chasing yeah. off a new thing started, and then we are back to square zero. So I think that these initiatives are quite good. Let us see how we can elevate the conversations around them to national priorities that cut across, you know, political party manifesto. So nobody comes to see, I put this in my manifesto, I've done it. But that we as Ghanaians have moved a step further in terms of uh, how we promote um, business, but also why should we ease of doing business, uh, ranking of the World Bank. And Rwanda is what, 40th? See the gap. You know. And they, they just went through a civil Exactly. War. And that's because there are priorities around which we say, okay, this is what Ghana needs, mm. irrespective of whether it's X, Y, Z. Let me just chip in the fact that uh, when the budget was read the mm. first year, there were mm. a lot of nuisance taxes that were mm. taken away. Mm. Did we see that reflect in the cost of doing business in Ghana? I haven't looked at the, 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 the recent uh, you know, rankings. Uh, but I think uh, some of those tax I thought were nuisance tax themselves. <laughs> um, you know, some of the taxes on banking services, for instance, mm. including you know, um, the you know, they, there was this effort to encourage people to uh, embrace technology, mm -hmm. you know, use ATMs, don't carry cash, mm -hmm. you know, do internet banking mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, all of these services became mm -hmm. taxable. Mm -hmm. Uh, because government, you know, needed money and saw the, this growth yeah. um, and, and thought it could tax it, and and I thought that was not that was not helpful. So because it, it's 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 actually contradicts. You know, you have to weigh. Mm. Yes, you might get the money now, mm. but you lose the opportunity of the growth. And mm. if you see what has happened in mobile money technology, mm. you know that is now a new banking area. Mm. So um, some of those I thought were were not helpful. I think. You know, these taxes, uh, they were introduced, I think, uh, some of the appropriate, uh, some of the uh, uh, bills actually were passed way down sometime in the middle of the year, mm. uh, some of the uh, finance bills mm. that were approved by parliament. So, and then you have to think about the actual implementation. So I don't think you see the effects now. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to think two, three years okay. to really begin to see if some of, but I think some of the ones on the services, maybe you might see the effects immediately mm. uh, and so on. But yeah, definitely I agree. The, the challenge though is that, you know, we need money yeah. mm -hmm. and we are reducing taxes. Yeah. So it has to be a, an agenda to promote growth in the sense that you feel that, okay, the tax bedding uh, would, would, would reduce the cost of doing business or create opportunities for more people to take risk mm. and therefore you know that will generate growth and then hopefully jobs um, and all of these things are medium to long term mm. kind of uh, outcomes that you, you hope for you won't see it you'll probably be seeing the last year in 2020 mm. if it's okay aha uh -huh. so for some of these economy types of these kinds of tools to dealing with the economy I, I, I don't, you know, yes, you get some, but I don't think it's directly linked mm. to those kinds of interventions. Mm. It takes a little while to, to see those things. Mr. Tanko, we're, we're mm. also supposed to see at least spare parts go down. Yeah. Now, suddenly, <laughs> we are told the prices are going, going up. up. <laughs> because of the paperless <laughs> points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, as I can't speak to the spare parts. Yeah. Um, I can fully read about that. But, um, one, I think, in terms of economic policies, you know, 
the changes are not overnight. I mean, the effects. So you might say, okay, we want to do A, B, C, D. But by the time it reflects in what goes on under the ground, I mean, it's this. But the cost of spare parts, other things, not just based on the taxes, you have other costs that, despite the reduction in the taxes, may save. But at you. least that's the communication, so that's the expectation. Well, that's the political communication. <laughs> That's the political communication. I think the government also has to be very careful that if you continue to overpromise, you know, you set the expectations so high that you know when people are confronted with the reality, um, the effects may not be very pleasant. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think they've overpromised in a number of areas, not just in terms of the effects of policies, but also how quickly those policies are going to translate into what happens in people's pockets. Mm. And Ghana is just a very small part of the world economic yeah. system. And yeah. there are so many other things that yeah. impact on um, yeah. our economy. Right. And um, so just by um, reducing tax on spare parts doesn't mean that maybe shipping costs may not have gone up, yeah. may not and mean that, that yeah. utility costs, yeah. et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. Mm. And I think that's where that's going to be. But, but in, that, in that regard, I think uh, the macroeconomic stability mm -hmm. has to be sort of commended because um, that is critical. You know, your inflation, energy deficit. You know, we, we, we uh, sometimes people and, uh, well, at least government itself sometimes mm -hmm. does not present mm -hmm. how challenging the economy is because, you know, between your wages um, and your, you know, um, uh, your debt servicing, mm -hmm and your statutory payments, mm. you actually have no discretionary funds yes. uh, to apply to anything. Mm. And that's why we are still borrowing. Yeah. And one of the reasons, you know, I mean, for me, one of the arguments that were made about uh, going to, you know, do uh, borrowing was, or smart borrowing, mm. was that we're going to borrow at a cheaper rate to mm. come and replace uh, um, other uh, a, a kind of loans that were more expensive so over time there will be a net benefit mm -hmm. in terms of our debt to uh, um, uh, debt to GDP ratio all right now that is important for us to be able to uh, assess mm -hmm. because we definitely need to address our debt profile because it, it sort of constrains us from doing a lot of things we still have the IMF uh, to about uh, the end of this year or 2019, April, depending. So that will be one of the measurements, I, you know, how we manage the debt. Mm. Because we have to see a gradual decline, and that can come from growth. So you have a lot more money, and therefore mm. you can pay your debt and service your debt, uh, and the ratios are not, are not huge. But this is a big part of, of the problem. Otherwise, you cannot do all of the spending you want to do with one million, one constituency, one yeah. district, one factory, yeah. one village, one dam, yeah. you know, and uh, uh, planting for food and dry, uh, jobs. jobs and all of that. So these are, this, that needs huge public funding. Mm. Uh, so if you're able to do that, you need money um, and, and you need to get growth, taxes and, and you know, other kinds of mm. benefits to be able to uh, implement those kind of programs. And that has to all be done in... Uh, two years maybe hmm. if you take elections here out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's not a it's a massive challenge so i think uh really managing you know the macro economy is is, is key uh and mm. and energy is key yeah. you know so you cannot return to doom so mm. because then you really are going to increase the cost of doing business in this mm. country and we are competing with other african countries yeah, and sure. other mm. asian and it is a global yeah you know, search for capital. So uh, what you offer is important. Mm. Two more things and then we'll look ahead uh, 2018. Let's talk about the fight against Galamse. Started with the media, yeah. uh, but government stepped in yeah. and now we have Operation Vanguard. Yeah. What do you make of this fight against Galamse, particularly in the year 2017? I think the, the media must be commended. You know, we've always been bashing the media. They are focused on sensational stories, um, short attention span, etc., etc., etc. 
But with the Galamse issue, the media has demonstrated a capacity to look beyond the sensational stories, to work together, you know, as a coalition, and to focus on the critical national issue and push and push and push. So I think in that sense, the media needs to be commended. Um, government has shown a lot of courage, I would say, because um, fighting Galamsi involves butting heads with very entrenched interests, mm -hmm. some of whom may, I'm using the word may, uh, be your supporters or financiers and etc. But it is such a complex, you know, issue that, yes, Vanguard would be just one part of what is needed yes. to address it. You know, how are we bringing the chiefs into this whole thing? How are communities involved in terms of the protection of uh, this, uh, the environment? The licensing regimes, who does it favor? You know, does it favor the Chinese expatriates? Does it, you know, how, what is, where is the place of small scale miners in this whole thing? Because at some point we tended to conflict Galamsey uh, with, with small scale, scale miners. And yet there are small scale miners doing very legitimate business that have been criminalized by this, you know. So more, a, a lot has been done, but I think a lot more needs to be done. We need to move beyond what is government doing, Galamsey is this, and to see what can we as citizens also do, mm. you know, to help in the fight. Because our very survival as a nation, yeah. as a people, depends on how effectively we are able to fight Galamsey. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think uh, the media, I, just to echo that, I think the media has to be commended. And I mean, it's the same kind of uh, response I want with corruption. Mm. Uh, I think it is another of that, you know, important national interest that, you know, we have to, we, we have to deal with it. Otherwise, it would completely undermine all our efforts. So, but it's not easy to get the same kind of, but mm -hmm. I think when the media and, and, you know, society decides that for this particular issue, mm -hmm. you know, we rise above all our interests and pursue. I wonder a, a, a how country. we can deal with, with corruption. It's, it's become, it's become almost impossible. <laughs> well, not to me. Hasn't it? Uh, not to me. I, I think that um, it's reached a point where we need to turn the corner so that's that's the you know we reach a point where the impunity the sort of looseness i mean people do it because really there's no punishment mm. and it's not that this is theoretical it is that that people have mm. and enjoy their booty uh, and they are happy you know mm. so there's no there's no real uh incentive not to engage in corruption and but it is, as I keep saying, it's a very dangerous thing mm. to fester because then you cannot trust society in any way. It doesn't matter what you do. Mm. If somebody will take money uh, to, you know, sidestep side the rules, yeah. break the rules, uh, compromise you, uh, make you vulnerable, then everything, your safety, mm. uh, your welfare, none of those things are safe. All you need to do is have money. Yeah. And if you get it legitimately, then even you can even uh, entice other more people. So for me, the key is that government has a role, but citizens have a role in a democracy. That we, just like Galam say, have to take a stand mm. and say no to corruption and ensure that we reward and punish people. You know, those who are fighting, those who are, uh, have integrity, we support them. Those who are, you know, corrupt, we punish them. We investigate, we punish them. We retrieve our monies. We have to take that attitude. And that's why I am completely uncompromising when it comes to the issue of corruption. And we're going to continue to push because it's one of the things that was very clear in the last election, that people are now fed up with, uh, with the corruption and the pervasiveness of it and so on and so forth and we need to find a way mm -hmm. to tackle it. So uh, a lot of us in civil society are committed uh, to it and we are trying as much as possible. I think the media mm -hmm. has also shown the commitment and we want the politicians, the bureaucracy, you know, citizens to get involved and, and help us uh, fight corruption. Mm -hmm. We will talk about that uh, with the Prosecutors Act. Mm -hmm. But the final one, 
Ghana Beyond Aid. That was also uh, one of the things that when the president talked about, we were happy because he was quite clear. Yeah. But we know that Star Ghana, for instance, <laughs> we can't do without you. Yeah. So when the basket hears this from the president, yeah. I wonder what plans you have for us in 2018. Okay. But let's look back in 2017. Okay, okay in 2017, I think, um, oh, yeah. Um, first was um, the support we give to civil society organizations, government agencies around the elections, you know, and the transition. Um, we then provided support to citizens, organizations, NGOs, etc to work around this whole issue around gender equality and mm. social inclusion because as we all recognize, yes, we say the economy is growing, inequality is widening. Um, huge swathes of our population are being excluded, you know, from access to basic social services. So we provided support, you know, around that. We're currently working towards providing support to civil society organizations on anti-corruption you know, and that's quite a sizable amount of money. So those are the key areas that we'll be doing some work on um, local governance. Um, is the port uh, nervous about Ghana beyond aid? Um, not really, because um, we built into the design of STAR for it to transition from a donor program into a national entity able to seek support to support I mean, uh, or to seek funding resources to support local organizations. So we are on track by 2020 to transition from being a fund that is supported or set up by uh, external donors mm -hmm. to a fund that mobilizes uh, resources everywhere to- Locally? Locally, but also internationally, foundations, etc. cetera, um, um, support. Mm. our developmental efforts. Okay, because I wonder, CDD, do you raise funds in Ghana? Well, we try. Um, uh, we are 20 That's years. That's always a challenge. Yeah. We are 20 years this year, so uh, we will try again. When we were 10 years, we tried uh, okay. to raise funds. But I think, uh, I mean, for me, the time, we, we need to take control of our own development. Um, and, you know, I think is persuading people that they are investing uh, in both their present and their future. Uh, so um, we have to make that effort. We have to make it work. I mean, we, we spend money on so many different things. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, we, we, those of us who do governance work, we struggle because business people feel, oh, okay, well, if I give you money, uh, you know, and I'm going for a party contract or a, a government contract or whatever, they will say that uh, you know you are political mm -hmm. or you are aligned to this person, you are aligned to that person. So they have those sensitivities, you know. But I think there are new crop of entrepreneurs and so on who appreciate this public service mm -hmm. because I mean, frankly, the kind of issues that we deal with, you cannot analyze an American contract mm -hmm. if you don't have organized, you know, non-state actors with the capacity and the resources mm -hmm. to be able to interpret and hold government accountable. Mm -hmm. The ordinary citizen, you know, unless they are trained and whatever, cannot do that. They might not even have access. They won't mm -hmm. even know. So I think in a modern society, you need these kinds of intermediary institutions, you know, to function. Mm -hmm. and otherwise, you know, government is too sophisticated mm -hmm. in, in its activities to expect that, you know, any single citizen can just mm. get direct information mm. and be able to assess and sure. analyze it and hold yeah. the government accountable. Let's end with the Special Prosecutors Act. Yes. And the General Secretary of the NDC mm. said something really interesting, that if it had to do with the previous actors, mm. uh, actors in the previous administration, then the Attorney General could easily do it. Mm. But it's because perhaps we're looking at prosecuting people within this current administration. That's why we need a special uh, prosecutor, a special person to do this. And I thought, okay, this is something I haven't thought about. But what are the expectations really of the special prosecutor? I mean, one of the reasons why we got involved, as I said, for me, you need an impetus. So um, we, we really have not done well in, in doing high profile uh, corruption cases. Sometimes the AG bungles it. Because of the, the link between 
the Attorney General uh, and, and, and the government in power and the reluctance to investigate and prosecute members of their own government. And this has been going on since the Fourth Republic was born. Um, and there has been a talk about having an independent prosecu prosecution's authority mm -hmm. overall. But I think there was a constitutional issue. You need to amend the constitution yeah. to have yeah. that set out yeah. very clearly. But I think some of us uh, appreciated that we cannot wait because I think people were getting really mm -hmm. frustrated mm -hmm. about the, 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 the failure to fight corruption uh, and felt that, okay, let's find a midpoint as a first stage uh, to dealing with the problem. Mm -hmm. Find somebody that you can, can be independent enough from the uh, Attorney General to be able to pursue corruption. And then later on, when you do amend the constitution, you can you know, basically convert that into a more serious sort of standalone prosecution authority. So for us, the expectation is, is the same, that you cannot rely on government to police itself. You, we need to make the special prosecutor work. And that, for me, is media, that is citizens. But that's the bureaucracy itself, because now you can ask yourself, how many cases are Yoko doing? Who, who is doing? What stage have they reached? They don't report to anybody. How many cases well, are Well, they charged? report to the presidents. Well, but that is, that, that, <laughs> that is problematic because these are institutions that are investigating alleged crimes against the state. We, as, 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 as the citizens. citizens and not spectators, yes. right, uh, who have the power, is a power that we have given uh, to the president mm. to exercise on our behalf. We need to know so that, you know, we are not thinking, oh, okay, maybe it's the president's friend, so that's why they didn't, you know, investigate that particular case and rather investigated this other because this person is from the other party. Those are the only ways in which you can ensure fairness, justice, which is critical in, the, in the, all of this. All of us should be subject to the same laws and rules of this country. So the fact that you don't even have investigative bodies communicating, it's a problem. You know, BNI, oh, they say BNI is investigating this, or oh, National Security is investigating this. You, you are just confused. And the, it, when you don't send clear signals to the citizenry that when you commit a crime, yeah. you will be investigated and you know, prosecuted, then you cannot fight corruption. And so um, it really behoves our citizens to ensure this is a new office. It's going to work only, as I said, if citizens take an interest in it, but mm -hmm. also if it's properly resourced. Doesn't matter who heads the of course office. It matters. Uh, the NDC, again, has said that if it's a an NPP lawyer, then forget it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, you know, I don't know what the, the people going around calling themselves NPP lawyers and so on. I mean, lawyers, I think it's the extent of partisanship, you know, and of course you have to look at everything else, including the person independence and, you know, uh, uh, their character uh, in terms of uh, corruption and so on and so forth. The good thing is that this will be subjected to parliamentary approval and all of those things mm. if you have done something that uh, people show that you are absolutely partisan it will come out mm. you know because at the end you will win this fight if there's public legitimacy mm. you the people trust that this mm. person mm. is working for us mm. you know so for me it's important who but beyond that it's about resources it's about uh, public vigilance mm. to make sure that this doesn't become another you know, organization where it's opaque and nobody knows what's going on. Sure. Mr. Tanko, what are your own expectations? Well, um, I think in a way, um, we need to manage expectations. We've almost set up the office of the special prosecutor as the silver bullet that is needed. Once we get a special prosecutor ego, I mean, all corruption is <laughs> will be fought. Um, forgetting that for that office to be effective, there is a requirement that you have other conditions mm. in place, like the resourcing. I mean, we've been very good at setting up offices and then starving them completely of the funding that is required for them to function. We need the issue of uh, how to maintain public confidence yeah. in the office. But we also need a citizenry that is willing to stand up 
and say this cannot go on. You know, I mean, we, we, we play around with the issues of corruption to make it look as if it's something that affects only the political class. Oh, yeah. But those who have lived through 1979 will tell you that when these things reach a certain boiling point, it explodes in ways that can't be controlled. You know, so it is in everybody's interest that mm. we ensure that corruption is fought vigorously, not just at the level of political appointees, but down to the lowest level where a parent who has seen the child gets aggregates seven, the best, and goes hopping from school to school and they say, we can't take your child, and then a child with obesity comes and then the man says, what is this, you know? So there is they did need to look beyond special prosecutors coming to fight, I mean, prosecute ministers and etc. You see, the corruption happens at all levels of mm. our society and must be fought at all levels. The special prosecutor, fantastic idea, by itself will not yeah. change anything. Mm. It needs to work in tandem with other uh, things, particularly citizens and media vigilance mm. action. Okay, so just before we wrap this up, because we're ending, yes. uh, real quick, what should be changing in 2018? What do you see based on what has happened back in 2017? Um, I think that the signaling from the president has to be much better uh, than we've had in 2017. Um, I, I think the reaction to allegations of corruption in the government uh, is not in sync with, with the people's uh, observations. I mean, um, there's almost a disconnect between, um, you know, what the way he sees these kinds of things and the way people see. And I think it is probably a misjudgment about the change and the expectations that people have. People really want to see he rise above uh, uh, things, you know, not doing the similar things to what has happened in the mm. past. It has to really be a high bar. Mm. So I think that has to change. Uh, because once the signaling is right, then you will get the system react. You know, so that will be for me uh, a key thing going forward. Um, I think uh, there are a lot of expectations in terms of the government's actual programs, you know, uh, development programs, mm -hmm. and the most important thing is ensuring, as the president has said, we get value for money. Uh, that you know you put competent people in place to do those things because every CD we spend, we need to get the maximum out of it because we don't have enough CDs. Mm. So it is very, it is, it's very important, you know, and, and that will mean that, again, you have to ensure that the procurement is right. Mm. You have to ensure that the people you don't create opportunity for people to engage in corruption and, and waste the resources. Because once you do that, then you won't deliver. Mm. All right. Just uncle, finally. Yeah, I think um, first the issue of corruption for the stability of our governance, for the security of our country, for the development of Ghana, we need to see a more determined but more coordinated fight against corruption in 2018. 2018 will be a critical year for us because um, from 2019 we enter the election year and nothing major happens. So if we want to, the big things need to happen in 2018. We need to pass the right to information. Um, law, you know, we need to more holistically but more inclusively address the issue of youth unemployment. We have seen bits and pieces of actions, you know, littered, mm. but it needs to be more coordinated and because the term youth quick was uh, voted the word of the year, I think, by the Guardian in the UK, but they were looking at youth and politics. Yeah. I will talk about a youth quake in Ghana here, but not in terms of politics, but in terms of security. Yeah. Okay. And that 2018 also needs to be the year that we look at how do we address this issue of youth unemployment. So fight corruption, mm -hmm. tackle the issues of um, youth unemployment, and then look at how we can create a more inclusive society, that the benefits of even the little development are spread more equitably. Amazing. Has a, All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for allowing me to pull you out of your home this <laughs> early uh, for joining us. Dr. Kojo Asante is a senior research fellow uh, f uh, 
Mm. Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Democratic Governance, the CDD. And also Mr. Ibrahim Tanko uh, is Programs Director, Star Ghana. I'm sure this year they are pumping a lot of money in the system <laughs> as well. We'll look forward to that. Uh, but we've been doing this at the in Ghana International Press Centre. I'd like to acknowledge my crew members. Uh, Isaac in charge of lightning, Eric Donko Sound, Elizabeth Omari, uh, my makeup artist, Jonathan Ajay uh, in charge of camera as well as Samuel Quadison also in charge of uh, camera, Modestus, TP, Israel, uh, Fossett, Frank Addo, and then Michael Atlote, uh, who is our driver who brought us onto this location today. My name is Mama Vio Swabwaji. We'll see you at uh, 6 a.m. tomorrow on the AM show. From the crew back in, in the studio led by uh, Derek Akolsab, we say goodbye. We'll see you tomorrow.